Hello again to all of you and welcome to the morning service this Father's Day. And what better way to start the service than to reflect on what God, our Heavenly Father, thinks about each one of us. Some of my favourite Bible verses are to be found in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43, where God is speaking through his prophet and explaining to his people how much he cares about them. So Isaiah 43. Do not be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called you by name and you are mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be with you. This is how much you mean to me. I love you. You are precious in my sight. So do not be afraid. I am with you. Such great love from our Abba Father. And it's no wonder when you think about it that the hymn writers, songwriters over the centuries have wanted to express um, and try and explain the love that God has for each one of us through words and music. So that as we praise God in worship, we are able to receive assurance of his care for us and we can know the hope and the peace and the comfort that comes from enjoying a relationship with God, our heavenly Father. George Mathewson says these words, O oh love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. And Charles Wesley, of course, another famous hymn writer, wrote these words, Tis love, tis love, you died for me. I hear your whispers in my heart. And it's as we reflect on those words that we're led into the Bible passage that uh, David's going to be speaking about later on in the service. Bible passage from Joshua chapter one, where again the Lord is speaking to his people, speaking to Joshua. And he says this, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So be strong and be of good courage. And as we reflect on those words from our Abba Father, shall we pray. Thank you, Abba Father, for your never ending, your no hidden agenda love for each one of us. Forgive us for the times when the things that we do wrong cause a distance between you and each one of us. But thank you that your love carries so much forgiveness in it that we are able to live in the absolute certain knowledge that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is revealed in his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen, and enjoy the rest of the service. Good morning. This morning's Bible reading comes from the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you that I will, what I promised Moses, wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, 
including all the land of the Hittites, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instructions continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua then commanded the officers of Israel, Go through the camp and tell the people to get their provisions ready. In three days you will cross the Jordan River and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you. Amen. Hello, this is our Sunday School. We can have lots of worries that get us down, but what we need to do is give them to God so he can take them off our shoulders. So we've, we're representing this by placing them on the fire so God can physically relieve us of our worries. One thing that I've been worried about is people who are malnourished living in the Yemen. So I'm burning that. One thing I'm worried about is, will I ever be allowed to go back to school? I worry about refugees who have to leave their homes. So I'm going to put that in the fire. I worry a lot about clowns. I'm worried. I wish my brother Lucas would ever come back. The second thing I'm worried about. This one is nightmares that keep me awake every night. I worry because our cat Jasmine gets in lots of fights with the other cats on our road. My last one is I'm scared of pirates. If they ever come back, because they're extinct, I think. And this one, and as you can see, if, if these are real, I'm going to be really, really zombie pirates. I'm worried about my grandma. I'm worried about my grandma and granddad getting ill or poor. So, these are a few of our worries, but now we've given them to God through prayer, so we don't need to be worried about them anymore. Because they've burnt in the fire. All your life, no one will be able to hold out against you. In the same way I was with Moses, I'll be with you. I won't give up on you. I won't leave you. Strength. Courage. Haven't I commanded you? Strength. Courage. Don't be timid. Don't get discouraged. God, your God, is with you every step you take. Hi, I just thought I'd stop on our walk along the Cleveland Way to show you this wonderful view that God has provided for us. Um, in the reading from Joshua, it talks about having courage that God will be with you every step of the way you take. And so to illustrate this, we've been playing some trust games on clout and rocks. And these are some games that we thought you could even try out at home with your own family and have trust in each other to help you show that even when you, f you feel discouraged, you don't need to because you can have faith 
that God will be with you all the time. Sometimes we can't see what we have faith in, but it's important to listen to the instructions. So we're going to have a little game where we blindfold Eli, I lead him around, he can't see what's in front of him and he doesn't know the way. That's a bit like when we have to listen to the instruction. The Bible has all the instructions on how we should be living our lives and we have to listen to what God has to tell us about what the way and the direction we should be leading in. So have a little go at this game, Find have a grown up lead you around, either get a blindfold or if you're improvising we're going to go with a vest. Use whatever you've got to hand. So I'm going to put this over Eli's head. How's that for you, Eli? Still see, still see, okie dokie. You're going to have to still be able to breathe. So how about that? Can't see my glasses. Okay, and you can also close your eyes. So I'll hold your hand and I will tell you what to do. Okay. Hello everyone. Today we continue our series on prayer by asking a simple question. What does an answer to prayer look like? To explore this, we're going to examine one of the most critical moments in the Old Testament narratives. The story I've chosen is a nail-bitingly dramatic and compelling tale of God's people truly finding themselves on the edge with all the challenges, demands and insecurities that such times so often bring to the fore. Now, in this story, God's people must have been experiencing a whole range of difficult and powerful emotions. Emotions which were jumbled up with the hopes and dreams which were at the heart of their faith identity as this graphic makes clear. To read through the narrative of the exodus from Egypt is to be immersed in a desperate journey of struggle, which begins with slavery, moves through inspiration and discontent, to the final denouement, as described in the closing chapters of the book of Deuteronomy and the opening chapters of the book of Joshua. Are God's people to stay stuck in the wilderness, or will they finally enter the promised land? Looking at the word cloud, we can begin to feel a certain sense of similarity with how it is for us today. The narratives are redolent with an all-pervasive sense of what it is to have faith in a time of turmoil and change. Which is why I chose the shape of the traffic sign indicating danger ahead, with the bold exclamation mark at the centre as the container for the word cloud. Because this is a moment of great danger for God's people. It is a profound turning point 
and there's no guarantee of which way their fortunes will turn. Indeed, looking at their journey to date, there is every danger that they will be faithless, beset by failure, and it will all end in tears. So close and yet so far. For this is an account in which both yearning and foreboding loom over the characters in equal measure. It is an account in which so much is at stake. It is an account in which the future is in the balance. It is an account in which nothing can be taken for granted. So perilous is the challenge facing God's people. For this reason, it is a story which resonates so powerfully today with our experiences of life in lockdown, poised as we are on the cusp of a dreadfully uncertain journey towards the normality we all crave. So at this point in the biblical story, we find ourselves looking out across the River Jordan to the land of promise beyond. This river, their final obstacle, is as much a barrier in the mind as it is in the landscape. If the people can get across the Jordan, and it is a big if, they are then faced with a military campaign to take and hold the land which is to be their home. The big question hanging over the whole picture is this. Will they remain faithful to God and do everything they can in God's power to enter the land of promise? Or will they do a U-turn and back away from the challenge, cowed and beaten in their faithlessness and failure? The context of this choice to press on or go back is absolutely crucial. The people are tired and weary, no doubt, for their journey has been so long. So many promises, so little progress to see. You can sense their spiritual exhaustion. It clings to them like a sea mist clings clamorly to the landscape, shrouding the familiar from view. And it is at this very moment that three huge factors come into play, each of them demanding enough, but put together they form a perfect conjunction of tough challenges which have the potential to overwhelm the people entirely. Moses is dying and a successor needs to take over and lead the people. What a moment to lose the leader who has brought them out of Egypt and taken them through all the trials and tribulations of the wilderness. The timing seems just awful. Then there is the challenge of actually getting everyone across the Jordan. In the narrative, it is clearly a significant obstacle to their progress. Will their solidarity hold? Will they get across together? Or will some decide that enough is enough? Then, once they are across, there is the small matter of taking the land. It isn't empty. It is populated and is home to a diverse range of peoples. Displacing them will be a huge challenge. To our modern sensibilities, it looks for all the world like ethnic cleansing and genocide, an enterprise of dubious morality, which is wearily familiar from the pages of history, right up to the present day. Or you could look at it another way and say that here are freed slaves taking back what they believe to be rightfully theirs. Either way, the biblical narrative presents us with a perfect storm of a change of leadership plus the greatest challenge to the future of the whole project. At stake is the way ahead for God's people. So the overriding question is this, what are the people and Joshua to do? Now it seems to me that they must have prayed right into the exclamation mark of danger and threat. It is, after all, just what we would do. And the texts go on to show how these unrecorded prayers are answered. 
The dialogue between God and Joshua surely maps out the answer to his and the people's prayers. And this answer enables Joshua to faithfully fulfil his calling and find his identity and purpose in God. It equips him to lead the people through the challenges they face and into the reality of God's gift. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, Moses commissions both the people and Joshua. You might like to read these passages out loud with me. Be strong and bold. Have no fear or dread of them, because it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and bold, for you are the one who will go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their ancestors to give them, and you will put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then the Lord commissioned Joshua, son of Nun, and said, Be strong and bold, for you shall bring the Israelites into the land that I promised them. I will be with you. And now we come to Joshua chapter 1, and to Joshua's understanding of what God is saying to him as an answer to prayer. Everything now hinges on what God is saying to him and his willingness to make this his own truth. God says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to act in accordance with all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you may be successful wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to act in accordance with all that is written in it. For then... You shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall be successful. I hereby command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And as we read the passages, we can't fail to be struck by the deeply totemic phrases that Moses uses. Phrases which flow straight from the heart of God. Phrases which have the power to shape, energise and equip us, and those who hear them, for the task ahead. They leap out of the text and are unmistakable signs of God answering fervent prayer. And one thing stands out. Moses and Joshua and the people are connected to God through prayer. And it is this intimate relationship with God that is the essential factor in the drama that now unfolds. We are told that Moses knew God face to face. The people and Joshua are told that God will be with them. A marvellously freeing truth in itself. But not only that, through prayer they come to understand with crystal clarity that God will not fail or forsake them. What they needed to hear in this moment of massive peril, they hear. God connects to their need, and they reach out and connect to God. The totemic phrases within the texts touch the very heart of their vulnerability and open the way for them to discover fresh resolve and renewed focus. These totemic answers to prayer speak right into the heart of the people's disquiet and fear as a deep reminder to be faithful, 
because God is first and foremost faithful. So Joshua is reminded of this deep truth. He's told, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Just ponder for a moment how precious this answer to prayer is as we long to enter the promised land of normality beyond lockdown. Just reflect on how releasing and affirming these promises are for black people who need to know that their lives matter. And then Joshua is reminded of the corollary to God's faithfulness. It's his own faithfulness in return. He's told, Act in accordance with all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Act in accordance with all that is written. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. So as an answer to prayer, Joshua is told to rely on scripture and keep it close to his heart and at the centre of his decision-making. In other words, he is to frame his whole worldview, attitudes and values on God's. Then in one of the two particularly striking totemic phrases that crop up repeatedly in these texts, Joshua is told to be strong. Now this can be unpacked in several equally important ways, I think. Joshua is to be resilient. He needs to be able to endure all that is demanded of him. He needs to have real capacity to do God's work and to accomplish and follow through and sustain the task to which God has called him. Then we come to the second totemic phrase. If Joshua needs to be strong, he also needs to be courageous. Through prayer and God's presence, through reading and reflecting on scripture, Joshua will muster the inner strength and courage God knows he is capable of. In order to be courageous, he must lean in to what he fears and confront the source of his anxiety and face up to it. He must overcome anything which makes him unsure of his own abilities, especially his ability to achieve all that is asked of him. In order to be courageous, he must be wholehearted and live from the holistic centre of who he is, He must be bold and imaginative and creative too, holding nothing back from God. So as he connects with God, Joshua is affirmed and uplifted by the universal truth that God brings hope to humanity. And it comes as no surprise to see that in his way, Jesus brings the same key facets of Joshua's answer to prayer to bear upon his disciples too. Here is the text from Matthew chapter 10, which is set for today. Don't fear those who aim to kill just the body, but are unable to touch the soul. The one to fear is he who can destroy you, soul and body, in the fires of hell. Look, If you sold a few sparrows, how much money would you get? A copper coin apiece, perhaps? And yet your father in heaven knows when these small sparrows fall to the ground. You, beloved, are worth so much more than a whole flock of sparrows. God knows everything about you, even the number of hairs on your head. So do not fear. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me on the narrow road, then you are not worthy of me. To find your life, you must lose your life, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 
Now, whilst it may not look similar to what God says to Joshua, in practice it conveys much the same message. Just looking at the contexts makes this plain. If we think about it, we would expect to encounter just the same range of emotions, hopes and fears in the disciples as we met in God's Exodus people in the Old Testament. The very same range of emotions, hopes and fears that we recognise in ourselves now. The disciples are in a similarly challenging place. There can be no going back. God's kingdom of love has to be their first priority. Despite the dangers and their very real fear, they must find the faith, strength and courage to follow Jesus and take up their cross. And in their time of need, Jesus answers their prayers by reminding them that God brings love. They are God's beloved. And in their time of need, Jesus answers their prayers by reminding them that God brings life. They are God's beloved and as such they should let go and find their life in God, the life bringer. So as we journey wearily through lockdown, as the undercurrents of our anxiety seem strong and threatening, as our exhaustion gets more troublesome, as the way ahead seems so indistinct and obscure, what shall we pray? What is God saying to you through these texts and stories? What is God saying to you through these totemic phrases? What is God saying to you through these answers to prayer? Might I suggest that looking to Joshua and listening to Jesus we pray like this. That God brings hope. We pray that God brings love. We pray that God brings life. And we pray that we too would faithfully fulfil our calling and find our identity and purpose in God. One thing is certain. If we feel ourselves to be on the edge, God will answer our prayers and that answer will be known in the embrace that gifts faithfulness, strength and courage to us and through us. God will answer our prayers, and that answer will be known in the embrace that gifts hope, love and life to us and through us. God bless everyone, and may God bless you with the answer to prayer that you need. Good morning everyone and welcome to our time of prayer. And thank you David for your teaching on the first 11 verses of Joshua. They give us a rich seam to pray into. But just before we start, I'd like to head up a few pointers and scriptures to, to strengthen us in our praying together. Because the Lord knows that many of us, maybe all of us, are growing weary. These are confusing times and there seems to be very little pointers to, the, to ending them. 
And we do need to renew our strength and our faith in God who hears our prayers and welcomes us to pray to him. We need to renew our faith daily and to be reassured that the Lord hears us. So listen first to these reassuring words from Psalm 139. You, Lord, have searched and known me. You know when I sit down, stand up, and when I lie down. You are intimately acquainted with all of my ways. And even before there's a word on my tongue, you know it altogether. How reassuring is this? The Lord knows exactly the place we're in. And Jesus himself assures us in Matthew 6 that our Father knows the things we have need of and indeed will add them to us as we seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And finally, John Wesley himself said this, Surely, or of certainty, God does nothing apart from the prayers of his people. So from that firm standpoint, let's move forward into a time of prayer. We offer up first our thanksgiving to you, Lord. So many things to thank you for. We've heard today from these verses out of Joshua that you promised your covenant people then, I will never leave you, or forsake you. Be of good courage. These are words that our Saviour, Lord, repeated 1,500 years later to the new covenant people, to us, that although he must leave us physically for a while, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Thank you, Lord, that we take comfort continually in your faithfulness to bless your church, to bless us individually, as we too adhere to your word, looking neither to the left or the right, but straight to the throne of grace and to Jesus. Obeying your commands, and taking care to embrace the whole counsel of God, of our God. Thank you indeed that your word is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. Lord, it is in your light that we see light. Father, Lord Jesus, we give you thanksgiving that you've shown yourself to be so close to us and so faithful to us as a church family throughout the long weeks of this lockdown. That you've been faithful to deliver us from the pestilence that walks in the darkness, from that secret place of refuge and provision that we can run into. We thank you too. We thank you so much, Lord, for the miracle of technology. And to our technicians here at Burniston, who through their love, their skills and their patience, have enabled us daily to draw close to you and to each other. In prayer, in our Bible studies, and in so many spirit-led acts of kindness, and sincere love, most of which only you know. We give thanks to you, Lord, for continually showing us the people who are on your heart and for whom you want us to pray, and for giving us ears to hear your voice. We have prayed and we will continue to pray, Lord, as you head up, as you head it up to us those who are struggling, the many who are struggling, the worn out, the lonely, the sick, the lost. You have moved us to pray and to cry out especially for those families that you know about living in fear, the children 
in fear of violence and abuse. Those souls without hope in this world, or even the knowledge of you. Lord, you have heard our every prayer, and we thank you that you have provided and will provide, that you will intervene, knowing that nothing is too difficult for you. We continue, Lord, to lift up to you again today, Christians globally, all over the world, who are being persecuted, pursued, imprisoned, intimidated, tortured. And in their hundreds, perhaps thousands, dying for their faith in the most terrible ways. Lord, we, we cannot comprehend what this level of faith or fear feels like. For upholding your name to the end, these people are suffering. Lord, give grace, pour out grace and comfort to them in proportion to their need, their great need. Show your power, show that you are God, the only God. Show your mercy continually, being a very present help in the midst of the evil that surrounds them. And Lord, we come to you now and we pray for our church here at Berniston. We're looking ahead now to the prospect of reopening partially and finally our return to real physical fellowship one with another. Our urgent prayer, Lord, is that you will prepare us, that you will prepare us, each one, that you will direct and lead us by your Holy Spirit towards the new so-called normal, Lord, that we know can never quite be normal again. We ask that you will enable us all to use the... Um, the patience, the suffering, the prayers, the experience to good in the next few weeks. We ask you, Lord, that as a united body, you will enable us to hear now, now in this time, what the Spirit is saying to the churches in this day and in this time, and grant us ears to hear what the Spirit is directing us. Grant us to be increased in the knowledge of you in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Lord, you know that the world encroaches and clamours more and more insistently into your church, your body with its demands for us to conform to its ungodly ways. Grant that we will continue in renewed strength to be a beacon of righteousness, guardians of your truth, holding fast and without compromise to that word which is able to save our souls and to many others as we reach out with the whole gospel. Unite us, please, Lord, in love and purpose. And in closing, I, I, I want to put us all in remembrance of the word you spoke to Joshua. Say to them, do not be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We embrace that word, Lord, as covenant people. And we pray this prayer and all of our prayers today and every day in the precious name of Jesus and only to bring glory to his name, the soon coming King. Come, Lord Jesus. 
And so if you will, say the Amen with me to these prayers. Amen. May the Lord bless us all and bless you, each one of us, and enable us to be a real blessing to others. Amen.